Hey friends, I've been hearing a lot of requests for a binding by machine tutorial. So here we go. I've got a fresh quilt right off the long arm and I'm gonna walk you through all the steps, including the mathematics you need to know on how to do quilt binding by machine. Are you ready? Let's get started. Well, well, welcome back everybody to So Well. I am your host, Rob Appel from Stitch in Heaven out in Quitman, Texas, and I am so blessed to see each and every one of you on the other side of the camera. And today's video is a real skill building video. We've been seeing tons and tons of requests. Maybe it's because you were just finishing your Christmas quilts. Not sure. We're beginning 2023 with a lot of how-to quilt videos. And today is how to bind a quilt by a machine. Now this quilt is a quilt actually pattern's not even available yet. Please don't ask that in the comments below. But what I would like to know in the comments today is what other kind of quilting skills may I offer for all of you into tutorial format. I will be working on creating a new ironing board real soon. Like I said, today is machine quilting. We've been, uh, excuse me, machine binding. We've been working on a lot of other things, uh, basic patterns. So please, in the comments today, let me know what you would like to learn next as you're uh, traveling your own quilting journey. Make sure you subscribe and like the videos while you're here. It really helps the channel grow. Now, I want to start with the mathematics of how to figure and calculate the amount of binding necessary to go on your quilt. Okay, so once the quilt has come out, and we're gonna get to trimming this off in a second, but let's just think we're gonna start by acquiring supplies. So not only are we gonna maybe need a small ruler, some big scissors, I'll show you how to use those later, a big ruler, I like a 60 millimeter rotary cutter for cutting through all the layers of my quilt once it's quilted. It just helps with accuracy a little bit. I also keep a stiletto handy, some small scissors. So all of these little tools plus the fabric for the binding is where we're going to start today. So now particularly this quilt I just finished, once everything is trimmed and been measured, is 74 inches by 80 inches. So for you to start your calculations, what you're going to do is you're going to Add your length plus your width, 74 plus the 80, and then you multiply that by two because you have four sides. So you're calculating the perimeter of the project, okay? Now I'm going to teach you some skills to rounding up so that you have plenty of fabric, and I'm hoping I'm correct because I literally have one thread extra today. So remember, length plus width times two gives you your perimeter of the project. Now, once you have that number, divide that number by 40, 40 inches, because that's the standard workable space in your fabric after you've done your mitered corners, which I'm also going to show you in today's video. Not only mitering the corners on the project, but also mitering the union of the binding to have the best seam possible in that binding. Okay, so you're dividing by 40 inches, and that's going to tell you how many strips of binding you need. So when I was done, I came up with like 7.7 .7 strips, but we're cutting strips of our width of our fabric. So we always round up to the next whole number. So again, length plus width times two divided by 40 and then round up so I need eight strips. I prefer to make my binding strips at two and a half inches. So I simply multiply that eight by two and a half and I came out with 20 inches. And you can see here, I have literally just barely enough. So I did, I took the time to press out my fabrics really nice. I've already cut a clean edge and I'm gonna start now by making my strips of binding two and a half inches wide. And I'm only going to cut basically two layers at a time because I want to make sure that all of my cutting is super accurate today. Sometimes if you cut with too many layers, you'll get these little wobbles and that could be a negative situation with just enough fabric to spare. Okay, so I basically have my 20 inches. I'm going to go ahead and cut down eight strips at two and a half all the way through. So now that I have successfully, barely, gotten eight strips at two and a half inches wide, next thing we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to miter our 
unions. If you haven't done this before, it's real easy. It's gonna be harder for you to see at home because I'm using a solid or the black batik because all of this quilt is made out of batik from Island Batik. So at any rate, my first strip is going to lay straight. We're just gonna call this right sides up. If you're using solids and you can't tell often, I'll just keep my fold as my right side. So I just make sure I have something real easy to spot over and over again. Now with batiks, it wouldn't matter because they're batiks, but nonetheless, it's good practice to get into. So right sides together and the second unit is gonna lay, or the second strip is gonna lay right here perpendicular with the outside edges matching. Now folks, let's stop here for a second. We have just barely enough length in all of our yardage of our fabric. I could have made nine strips and then I wouldn't be worried about it. And at that point I would have cut off the selvages. But in this situation, I'm teaching you how to get away with just the very least. So what we're gonna do is the selvage is still on the batik. Batik selvages are wonderful to use in the project if you need. Plus we're gonna sew, they're gonna all get left over in the quarter inch seam allowance. But nonetheless, I just wanted you to understand I'm utilizing the selvages so that I'm not trimming any excess off the fabric. Now I'm gonna sew from what I'm calling this upper top corner down to the bottom corner on a diagonal. I'm gonna do this visually and it will probably be slightly sloppy. But you certainly could do this with a ruler, a chalk line, um, a laser guide, anything. I just kind of come down here and find where my bottom point is. I'm looking at that as I begin sewing straight. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and cut that thread. And lifting the foot on the first one, I always check to make sure it's gonna work. And when I say it's gonna work, I mean it's gonna lay straight, all of my strip is going, and I'm not even gonna bother to trim off the excess yet. Now what I do is I keep sliding my trim, my binding. Now this is right sides up. So I take my next fabric, which would be right sides up, and I now lay it over here pointing down into my lap, line up my outside edges. So I'm basically doing what we call chain piecing now. Okay, and I'm just gonna drop the presser foot again, find that other bottom corner and stitched right to it. I have done this with every quilt in the last five or six years. So this makes total sense to me now at this point. But if you wanna check each union, you can. What I like to start to do now is I've just now folded, right, my binding strip in half. Here's my fold. That shows me that I'm now right sides up. Remember, I had that fold up earlier when working with solids or something that reads like a solid, like a batik. Next fabric is gonna go right back as the other ones have. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a 45 or bias joining across here. And as you can see, I did, I just chain pieced all of my strips there. And now I'm gonna use the thread cutter on my machine or my little block thread cutter to cut apart the chain piecing, like yay. And then I just start basically on one end and I'm doing two things at once. I'm gonna inspect to make sure that everything is in the right direction. So right now I'm making sure my seams are on one side of the project and I'm also gonna come back as I go through and I'm just gonna eyeball trim. Of course you should use your ruler for safety, but basically making what would have been a quarter inch seam allowance. There you can see the blue thread that I actually am using today so you can see what I'm looking at there. Okay, so now as I go through, I'm just making sure, making sure, see that seam was on the appropriate side. So again, quickly trim. Okay, and so we're, inspecting and trimming off the excess. And the next step is we'll go to the ironing board and press this right sides out. Once all the binding is trimmed and ready to be pressed, what I really like to do is have a big ironing surface, but you wouldn't be able to see the binding very well today. So I've got my wonderful wool pressing mat so you can see the black 
so it doesn't get lost on the black mat. But I really do. I find one of the starting ends and I throw all the rest over onto the floor because gravity is our friend in this situation also. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I can see this seam, right? I can see all of the bulk. I don't care what's going on down over there on the floor. Now what I'm going to do is I'm making sure that I'm pressing my binding so that it's right sides out, wrong sides together. So I'm getting rid of all of those raw seams. So I'm just matching up the edges. Got a bit of steam in my iron. And I'm just going to go through and just press or slide glide little sections at a time. Again, I like a bigger board so I could continue on, but you can't see what's happening down here. So that won't do us any good in the instructional video today, right? So the other thing I'll take and do now is I kind of loose fold. I don't want this binding all over the place. I really want to be able to control it as I'm stitching it on to the back of the quilt on the first go about. So I kind of loose fold it. I've also been known to take an old spool, an empty spool of thread and wrap this around the spool of thread because it keeps it tidy and you can keep it on your sewing machine that way. That's not available to everybody, so I thought I would just show as most um, generic assembly as possible here. And as I get into the seam, I'm just allowing one side to press one way, one side to press the other in there. And then again, I'm just going to go ahead and wind up the binding as I go here. But let's bounce ahead and go ahead and trim the last edge on our quilt. Like I said, normally you would have trimmed the entire project first so you can pull real accurate measurements for your length plus your width times two. But in this situation, I wanted you to see one of my tricks for accuracy-ish in quilt making. So I've left one of these edges to still be trimmed off. I do, like I said, use a pretty big rotary cutter like the 60 mil and the biggest ruler I have available to me as well. Now, originally I had to start somewhere. So I chose some patchwork that gave me an opportunity to cut a real nice edge using this line here, right? To begin with. So I am actually now looking for eight inches from this seam to my outside edge. It'll leave just a little bit of batting showing, but I can wrap that as I come around with the binding. Okay, and then so I also just knew on my perimeter down or using my points, I was able to use those to calculate as well. So let me show you what I'm trying to teach you here. First thing is get your quilt organized and tidy. The area you're working in, you want nice and flat. The rest of this over here isn't going to matter, but this area needs to be incredibly flat, easy to handle easy to manipulate. And then there's a couple of things I'm going to do. I'm going to start because I have the weight of the quilt towards me by first coming up here and just getting an eyeball on the top of my ruler to make sure that things are running somewhat straight. Then I'm finding my seam allowance running right through here. And I'm going to shift so that my black line, that's my eight inch mark, and I'm tracking it all the way through all the seams of the patchwork. Sometimes I might shift or encourage the quilt just slightly to make sure it looks really crisp in comparison to the outside edge. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and make a slice. Okay, I've cut down through, and again, you can see some of this batting showing through, but I'm gonna pull that binding just far enough. If I was concerned, I could come back in and adjust that cut to a seven and three quarters cut, but then I'm really risking losing a lot of this tip in the binding, which we don't want to do if possible. Okay. So again, I'm just going to now slide the quilt a little bit at a time using some of the cut edge to help remain accurate on the ruler. So not using the full ruler for each cut. Back in, I'm checking my seam allowance as it runs through, 
making sure everything looks as it should, encouraging the quilt anywhere I need to. And again, we're just going to go ahead and trim this excess. Take your time with this. You don't need to be in a rush. This edge will also be our sewing line edge. So do make sure you cut it clean, just like you would if you were doing any of your patchwork. Again, outside edge, matching my seam allowance. This creates a very um, symmetrical feel between the background and the edge. That's the trick there. Checking for square now at the bottom as I get here. Almost perfect, so I feel great. Closer than any other quilt I've probably ever made. Here we go. <laughs> Cutting it down. Put this in your bin of scraps for your dog bed friends and things, and we are ready to start to get that binding starting with the backside of the project. So let me tidy this up and I'll be right back. So with all four edges of the quilt trimmed down for accuracy and all of the binding strips made, stitched together, pressed to the right sides out and rolled for tidiness, we are ready to really get started. There's a couple of different things I want you to consider and maybe it's easier if I just kind of point out like the quilt on the back wall. A lot of times I kind of start at the bottom corner of my quilt project uh, or bottom center because uh, there's going to be a seam. It probably won't show up, but it might. And so let's find a place where it's going to be hidden. That's for our starting. And for our starting, we're also going to go to the back side of the quilt project. So you're going to see now three new steps. We're going to stitch on to the back. I'm going to teach you how to prepare for your mitered corners. Then I will show you how to join the binding as you're coming back around to finish the loop of the quilt or the lap of the quilt. And then I will teach you how to do the top and the other half of the binder, the mitered corner. So we've got a lot to still learn. Stick with me here, folks. Um, right now we are on the backside of the quilt project and I'm gonna pull off eight to 10 inches of binding and I'm gonna leave that loose. This will be where we tie back into later. And now as I approach the presser foot, I have my raw edges over here on my binding going towards the raw edges of the quilt itself. I'm leaving an eight to 10 inch tail, sliding this under, and we are literally just gonna do a nice easy quarter inch. Now with a two and a half inch binding, you could cheat it over a little bit if you wanted, but that means your binding is gonna be narrower on the other side. For this project you saw, I have a lot of batting I need to cover, so I'm gonna go with just a quarter inch, yet not try to pull too much to the other side. Let's see how this goes together, folks. So here we go, I've got needle down, also engaged, because I'll be doing a lot of starting and stopping as I'm stitching. And just going ahead and I'm gonna sew this on, watching the raw edges of the binding at my quarter inch mark with the raw edges of the quilt. Lots of layers here. So take it nice and slow. Let the feed dogs do the work for you. Another thing that I'm constantly doing throughout this process is I'm adjusting the weight of the quilt on the table. I don't want any drag down here in my lap. I want everything, especially because I'm standing, the weight of the table is, is carrying the quilt and I'm just adjusting so I have eight or 10 or 12 inches of working space down here that seems to have no real tension on it from gravity right now. Okay, let's get back to this stitching. As we approach a corner, so we can prepare for our first mitering. Okay, so as we approach the corner here, I'm gonna to start to slow down and I really wanna stop with my needle at a quarter inch back from the edge of the quilt. So right here, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna encourage you to back stitch, lock it down and then cut your threads. 
Now this is easiest to do at the machine. I'll do another one so that you can see it, see it under this top camera. But right now, let me just try to do it at the machine because this is really where you'll be doing it also. This technique for the miter corner is all about the fold. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold up so up from the edge I'm about to sew onto, and at this point I just kind of naturally rotate everything. Then I bring down the binding to match along this outside raw edge I'm about to approach. And in doing so, I have squared this top fold and this outside fold to the other fold that was created. So everything lines up one, two, and three as square, but there's actually a diagonal fold right in there. Then slide that project right back under where you think your quarter inch is, and go ahead and start sewing in to the next side. And then from here on, it's just gonna be business as usual as you stitch all the way along those raw edges of the binding and the quilt top, or quilt back, I should say. And I'll also point out how nice it is to be able to manage the binding strip just right here on the table a little bit at a time. Make sure you have no drag on your quilt, no weight on your quilt that's causing it to stretch or distort with the binding. And just keep on working, get all four of those corners done. And I will show you then how to join the edges of your binding on a miter as well. Folks, we are almost to the next step where we join the binding seams. I wanna stitch right to that edge because I don't wanna deal with any of that in my next step. Okay, so now that I'm past that, I'm gonna go ahead and lock in my stitches by doing a back stitch cutting my threads and removing the quilt project. Okay, this is where we're gonna use those big scissors, believe it or not. And again, I want plenty of space in my work area as I'm getting ready to do all of this. I wanna be able to see my quilt real nice and flat and I've also, folks, now taken the time because I have almost one entire extra strip, right? Because by using 40 inches as our divisible, that really makes us have the extra so that accounts for the corners. So I guess if I was really feeling like a show off, I would have taken this flat edge and I would have joined it into that miter because I can, but I don't want to try to do that here, because that's really, really tricky. So let's do it the easy way. I, like I said, stitch past it. Now I'm pulling out a little bit of the stitching from earlier so that I can have roughly a six to eight inch gap here between the two edges. The wider this opening is, the easier it will be to manipulate our fabrics. But it will also, the further this distance is, make it less accurate the way I'm gonna teach you. So let's not get carried away. Six to eight inches is plenty in there, okay? And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring this binding over, and let me drop in a ruler so we can really see what we're doing, okay? So right now, I'm just gonna use this six as my cut mark. And I am, I'm cutting it with scissors, I'm cutting it straight. There we go, okay? Now what I need to do is I want to bring this other binding past the cut the same distance that the binding is wide. So my binding is two and a half inches wide, so I'm going to go past this six, two inches. Five, four, two and a half, I should have said, to three and a half here. Okay, and I'm going to use the scissors. And again, this is why I'm using my scissors because I can lay the scissor along the ruler, get myself a nice, straight, accurate cut. From that point, I probably should teach us all to use a couple of straight pins. We are gonna now miter this corner, or this union too. And again, if you're feeling a little taut in here, you can now pull out a few more stitches if you need, okay? And what we're gonna do is we need to make sure we stay right sides together. So right now, I'm gonna open this one up and I'm gonna lay it flat. That's right sides, there's my fold. Now this one, 
right sides. I'm going to twist. And at this point, we have to start to squish the quilt up. So the first thing I'm now looking for is my outside edges to line up. And I'm going to secure that with a straight pin right now. The next edge I'm looking to line up are the top edges. So sometimes you'll get a wrinkle because of those folds in here. So take the time to really gently flatten that out. Of course, I'm over explaining this and overdoing it, so you'll learn. And put a pin through the fabric. Try not to put it in your finger, because I just did and it hurts. <laughs> now we're going to do the same stitching, folks. We're going to sew from this top corner down to the bottom corner, not into the pins. We're going to remove them as we get there. So this is where I really wish I was an octopus. I wish I had eight arms and I could manipulate all of this fabric gently, but I can't. I start to stress, I start to sweat, it drives me nuts. But I technically just need to find the top corner we've prepared. Here it comes. Rotate the quilt so I can sew what was that diagonal line earlier. And you can see, this is why I say the greater the distance between the stop points, the easier it is to manipulate. Okay, here we go. I'm going to lower the presser foot. I'm going to get a couple of stitches in here. One, two, three. That holds it. Now I can go back in and I can tidy up all of my edges, getting all of my ripples away. Okay, and now I'm going to start sewing towards that bottom corner, just like we did, removing my pin. Right through the edge. And folks, you'll notice I don't backstitch this very often because I'm not always sure I'm getting it right. And if you backstitch and you get it wrong, then you've got more work to do as well. So at any rate, let's pull this other pin that we didn't have to stitch through. Now, once I come off the machine, I just kind of pull it and wiggle it and make sure that I've gotten everything correct before I cut out the excess and or before I lock in any more stitches because if you don't get it right, you're gonna have to undo it and um, restitch it to make sure that it's correct. Now, take your scissors because you have all this fabric around and just gently trim this back, real careful of your hands and all of your other fabric around you. You don't wanna cut into anything you don't want to right now. It's also not a bad idea just to take a moment and come over to your pressing station if you can and just press this because that'll set that top edge real nice that we'll be using in a few minutes for our top stitching. Okay, so that's been manipulated, but we still need to finish the stitching to a, the back of the project. So you've created the general union between the two binding tails. Now let's come back up here where we had locked in that stitching, lower that presser foot. I like to start about an inch behind it, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and finish out attaching the binding to the back of the quilt project. Coming right in now here, uh, we'll go ahead and backstitch to lock that all in. And we can cut threads, lift in the presser foot. Okay, so now the binding is all the way around. So when we start to pull this to the front of our quilt, this is the finished edge. This is the crisp, nicely pressed edge. So what I wanna do for this project, because there are sections where I have some extra batting really hanging out. How, there it is, perfect. Stop moving the project around so you can see it. See all of this batting here? That was left because of the size of the quilt and the way I wanted the points to show up. So now we're going to be able to preen this binding around and just cover it. But what I want my binding to look like is <laughs> equal all the way along the edge. So I don't just want to be pulling the binding fat where I need to cover up. So I'm choosing the fattest spot in the quilt we're gonna make that the spot that we're just gonna to stick to. And in order to do that, I like to get a nice flat run on my quilt. And I'm going to make sure I'm not adding any twist to the binding at all, bringing it over and I'm lying it flat. Now, there's a couple of different techniques. I like to do a straight stitch, a top stitch right along the edge. So I'm gonna set my needle right where it goes. Some folks might wanna do a decorative stitch or a zigzag. They're also concerned with what is the back gonna look like. So right now, 
I'm using black thread on the back, which is going to be pretty similar to the variegated thread I used on the back of the quilt project. You can see it kind of shows up. It was the thread I had in the machine. You should also really consider using the thread that you've already quilted all of the back bobbin quilt work with so that it just looks like it's all part of the quilting. The goal is to keep our stitch as equidistant from the back of the fold as well on the binding. This is not necessarily quilt judge approved. So this is getting her done. This is finished is better than perfect. This is going to last and hold up, but I am not an award winning quilt maker. I'm a video making quilt maker. <laughs> okay, folks, now I promised I'd use blue thread so you can see what's going on. So as I lower this presser foot right now, I am literally going to just try to keep that needle ever so close to the edge, looking behind my foot. I really like what I'm seeing. So now I'm gonna use my best eyeball, or I could put an edge guide right here to make sure that this binding all stays equidistant. You can use your fingers to find where the fold is on the back so you can really feel like things are being consistent. And just don't go so slow that you, excuse me, don't go so fast that you lose your targeting on the top. You really want this to look somewhat accurate as you're doing your top stitching. Here we're coming into where the mitered seam is. Any of the mitered seams so it gets a little thick, so just let your feed dogs do the work. And then I'll show you how to finish out one of these corners. As I am about four to five inches away from the corner, I start to prepare for manipulation. I have folded over so that my binding lines up nice. We're going to do the same sort of folding technique. I'm reaching now down along the new edge, six or eight inches, and making sure this folds without a twist. Now from here, a couple of different ways, whichever you find easiest, but I want to tuck flat, and you notice I'm using a stiletto or I could use a seam ripper or the edge of a scissor. And then I want to bring over this tip from the first edge, creating that really nice miter. I do hope you can see that. And then I'm gonna hold this right here with my stiletto until my needle parks right about there. So I'm coming in, I'm coming in, I'm coming in. Now the needle has replaced the stiletto this machine has an automatic presser foot lift. So not sure if you're picking up on this. That's one of the reasons I love it. Needle down on binding, foot lift up so that I, without any other manipulations, keeping my hand on the project now, I can rotate around, lower the presser foot again, and just keep on stitching. And I've come out of that corner there right here real nicely. Okay? Now, you're gonna keep your focus on the outside edge, staying equidistant. You're gonna keep that stitching right there, looking at the toe of your foot, keeping all of that real accurate if possible. And you're gonna just keep on keeping on until you get to the next corner. And I'll show you that same corner trick one more time as we get up there. Okay, so as we're heading into this last corner, as a reminder, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this bottom binding, the binding I'm about to get to, and I'm gonna fold it up into the project. And then I'm gonna use my fingers, creating that crease and a stiletto or something that I can protect my hand with here to now go ahead and let that mitered corner prep go right into the needle. And then once I can see that I've pierced it right where those fabrics cross, I'm gonna rotate. And sometimes the back end of your presser foot might get caught, so just make sure everything gets going nice at this moment. And then I'm actually in the very, very home stretch where we started sewing on the binding is just about uh, you know 20 inches 
down the road here in my lap. So let's just keep ripping through this, watching the edge, making sure everything looks nice. And you'll see how the binding stitching just comes right back to our start point. Okay, so you can start to see it approaching in the camera now. Here it is. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stitch to it. I'm gonna hit it, a couple, three, four threads over it. I'm gonna back stitch one, two, three, and that's it, folks. I don't wanna show up too much stitching and over stitching to show where my start and stop was. I can cut my thread. We can lift the presser foot and I'll come back in and trim that. But look, there it is. The binding is completely around all of this quilt. As a reminder, this quilt is called Cosmic Charlie. I just put the binding on it, so I'm still going to draft the pattern. So if you're watching this probably March 2023 and on, there should be a link in the description for this pattern as well. But up until that point, I'm still in progress of working on it. So I did want to share with all of you a really fun, easy and accurate way to put on your quilt binding by machine. It will take you a lot less time than by hand, but it won't be as quick as I made it look today because I had to cut out all the sections where I was sewing all the way around. I did use the blue thread so you can see the top stitching uh, as we go. And here on the back, you can see uh, hopefully some of the black perimeter thread. That was the bobbin showing up. And you just want to hopefully keep it at a nice distance from that folded back of the binding. Uh, I did point out that this is not necessarily quilt judge approved. Um, however, I did have a really fun interview with a uh, certified quilt judge, Brandy Maslowski, the quilter on fire. And I believe she was telling me that if you are gonna miter your corners this way, the judges wanna see your nostrils heading in opposite directions. So with that piece of information, <laughs> I think she meant the nostrils on your binding, which means one's up and one's down. I don't know. I'm going to leave you hanging there. But as a reminder, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you comment and like this video. It helps us grow. I would like to know what other kinds of new quilting technique, uh, project, block, uh, what can I teach you? What can, what can we learn together here at So Well um, doing these fun tutorials? And I, again, just really appreciate seeing you all out there. And I will be back real soon with another great tutorial for you. Until then, stay well, everybody. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It really helps support our channel. If you haven't subscribed, do so now. Hit the little button to be notified every time we go live or do a new video for all of you. And here's one from the past I think you'll really enjoy.